Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to the Nelson Dubois Show once again. Today I had a talk with a good friend, Joe Butcher. He's in a band called Wolf and Chain, and um, they're an Adelaide based band that is just coming into, um, they're releasing some singles at the moment, which is um, an exciting time. And I really enjoyed discussing with Joe um, the process behind that and how, to, how they have approached becoming more professional. Uh, so please enjoy the show. This is Joe Butcher. Good afternoon, Joe Butcher. How are you? Good afternoon, Nelson. I'm very well, thank you. How are you, Jeff? Fantastic. I'm very well. It's morning here, actually, and it's probably not even afternoon for you either. It's evening. It is. It is now 6.30 in the evening. It's very dark here. Fantastic. Um, Let's do it. The singles. Oh, so, sorry, you're in a band called Wolf and Chain, which is a fantastic band. I've been listening to the singles that have come out. Um, religiously it's really like honestly really really good um thank you so much from the sound and like the continuity and the 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 performances the songwriting really really amazing um in being in a band setting um i'd assume that such great releases take a certain amount of um mutual understanding among the bands of like this is what we're doing we're all going to be hitting this hard let's do this starting now kind of thing mm. um can you tell me what those conversations look like and when uh, when they when they occurred like how how long ago did you decide as a band let's do this right so when we formed the band under this name we had just dissolved a previous group where it became apparent that our goals were not aligned and the the singer jack uh, our bass player harry and myself all knew that we wanted to take this further and perform and release music to some polished level and at that point we we met with sam who harry and i had already been jamming with with a separate project just like casual weekend band jams um and he yeah he joined the band under the, the same pretense of that we were gonna go into the studio and record an ep of some description a number of songs and at that point uh we talked a little bit about kind of how we wanted to go about it and we started making some demos and just having gone through uni and doing lots of songs together um, and individually, we kind of took a little bit of inspiration from uh, yourself and actually the project you were involved with, with the McKenzie project, mm -hmm. uh, the, the pre-production kind of side, that was kind of where we all got on board to yeah to say what we were going to do was we were going to record the songs pretty quick and dirty, but get every single musical idea into the recording so that when we got into the studio on the days that we had dedicated to be recording days, we would perform them exactly as that part. And there would be no umming and ahhing of like, Oh, does it, is that how that part goes? Like that kind of thing. So we decided to, that's kind of how we went about it. And so then we made pretty polished demos of, every song we didn't really mix them but we played every single part exactly as we intended it to be on the ep and we we changed some things in pretty minor ways just in such a way that we didn't have to re-record them so it was like we would create the idea be like this is how we want it to be we'd then talk about it and we had written notes to say this is how it's actually going to be on the recording where we were de deviating from the pre-production does that make sense yeah yeah um so, so that was pretty early on in this band's lifestyle life life cycle i suppose but it was um after a, a like a, an attempt or two from our previous projects that were unsuccessful kind of thing right and when so for example when um sam the drummer um joined like was there a conversation with him that like we're really hitting this hard or is it did he kind of join and then that kind of uh, 
like we knew that he was an exceptional player and he was keen to get involved. So we, we got him in. And then I guess shortly after we like had him in, we just started having conversations about the pre-production in general. And that is kind of where like, as a band meeting kind of format, we talked about how we really didn't want to mess around. We didn't want to do anything half assed We really wanted to come out on all fronts swinging with everything. Cause I just feel like, yeah, but the way we were talking about doing it, we knew we wanted, I wanted, I, I knew I personally wanted someone else to mix it and master it because having done previous projects, I just know that's not my forte and it's just takes too long to get a product that I'm not 10 out of 10 stoked with, you know? So I was happy to, he says, begrudgingly, I was happy to do the editing. Not that I enjoyed much of it, to be perfectly honest. Um, that was a learning process in itself, but we pretty early on in that stage decided that we want to take this really seriously. And like bands are putting out really polished recordings this day and age. And like, there's no, re like if we, if ours is anything below that standard, I felt like it's just going to fall through the cracks mm. and it already has the risk of falling through the cracks anyway, because of just market saturation. So we just, we really don't want any excuse for people to like not listen to it. Cause that sounds a bit rough kind of thing yeah um and we might not go quite as heavily produced as we did this time not that we did anything crazy but i think there we're looking now for follow-up recordings at ways of doing it so that we can get a little bit more live energy in there and let so we might track drums and bass live in the room and then do overdubs on top of that but um, cause this one, we just, yeah, we multi-tracked everything individually and heavily edited everything to the click. And that was just kind of how it, we had conversations about that as being part of the stylistic choices we were going for as well. So like the, the bands that we grew up with, mm. like some of our influences are pretty grungy and like live takes, but most of the stuff we were looking at was like lots of pop references and pop punk stuff. That's very, like chopped and yeah. gridded and auto tuned. And we were like, we, before I, yeah, kind of early in that stuff, we also had a look at a few like stems. Like we just got sessions of like, what was the, can't think of the band right now, but we, we downloaded some stems from a pop punk band and we loaded them all up and had a look at what they had. And we were looking at like their vocal stuff in particular. And it was like, heavily tuned hard hard tuned gang vocals for the harmonies and stuff and but once you put it in the mix it all kind of you don't wouldn't pick it out it's not like the affected um auto tune that we're used to of like growing up with ridiculing you know what i mean yeah um yeah can you talk about the the levels of the recording process, the, the, the steps. So like what, what kind what came first? So, so we did drums first to the click. Um, we had that rough. That's what I tracked. We had that roughly quantized as well. Not totally done, but quantized to the grid so that I could play to that at rehearsal. So we used a, a combination of that and some, pre-pro stuff that was also on the click um, for me to listen to during the two days of guitar tracking. And then after that, we did a rough comp of that um, and the bass to give, to let Jack sing over. And then we, whilst Jack was singing and recording over that kind of roughly done stuff, we were each individually comping and editing our own stuff, quantizing all of our bits as we saw fit and, uh, doing a few spot re-recordings as we went where we needed to change some parts. Yeah. We all, um, we also use some samples from pre-production even as well, because I just couldn't get them out of my head having heard them for so long mm. over and over again, I couldn't replicate what was happening there. So I ended up just using them in the final recordings and the Jared to mix. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. When you were select, 
selecting a PR representative, what were some of the criteria that they had to meet in order to, um, to represent you? Um, that is a good question. Well, we contacted a few that we liked that basically just managed bands that we liked already. I just thought, well, why should we, we're also a legitimate band. We want to push out our image of being a legitimate band in every way, shape and form. Why would we not also go to a legitimate agency that does all the other regular bands mm. that we see in here every day? Um, so we contacted um, a couple and one of them, I guess they, we, our social media was not updated yet. So this was before we'd posted any of our new images, uh, any started any of our PR plan, I guess, because we were searching for a PR dude, but um, one of them recommended us to kick push PR and he is in Victoria, this lovely man, Michael Gill. And we were conveniently going over there everyone except Luke, we were all going over to Victoria to Good Things Festival in Melbourne. And we hit Michael up to see if he wanted to grab coffee and actually have a chat, which was good. Cause I cut, like, I would, I'd be lying if I didn't go into it pretty skeptically. Mm -hmm. um, but we went in, yeah. Cause I, I don't know, you just kind of, I, had, I was a bit, yeah, I was just, I was just skeptical. I wasn't sure really what he was going to be doing that we couldn't do ourselves. And, um, we'd gotten quotes for him and it seemed like a lot of money at the time. And we were like, Oh, I don't know. That's a lot of money, but we were already feeling kind of like we've spent X amount of dollars to make the recordings as polished and take that as seriously as we want it to. What's the point if nobody sees or hears the music. Mm -hmm. So, and he reiterated that when we met with him, he just told us kind of what his whole deal was and the kind of plans he's run with other bands and things like that. And just, it was just good, great to meet with him. He was just a real down to earth, normal dude doing his thing. He's trying to run a small business. It's just like everyone else does. And, but yeah, he just got us all on the same page. It was really good. And he was kind of down to work with whatever we wanted. So we just kind of met with him and, he did his spiel and gave us a quote and we'd had quotes from other people and it was, we kind of just made a call that like, that was the one we were going to go with. We'd looked at his artist roster and the stuff that he'd been putting out for other bands and they were all seemed to be going pretty well. And we really liked the guy himself. And once we started and we got his big list of all the dates, like the kind of stuff that he wanted to do with us, we thought that sounds dope. So we just went with it. Mm. So, uh, so you've outsourced PR um, to, mm. to whatever degree. Um, what's, what's next for outsourcing? And perhaps that's not um, something that you alone are in a position to, <laughs> to, to disclose. Mm. But, um, we have been hassling a few managers because obviously PR is not management, I guess. Mm. Um, we've been hassling managers who have it in with booking agencies and the venues that we want to play. So, uh, maybe I'll spare her from this, the, this poor girl. Jack's been relentless. God bless him. But, um, it's good. I guess. I don't know. She's taking notice. We put out some stuff. I think, we, we approached a couple of people once we had the songs done and they were all kind of like, eh, I don't know. they really liked the songs, but I guess our PR and well, our social media presence was basically pretty bare bones and amateur photographs and kind of a bit rough looking and maybe, maybe full of too many memes. That's kind of my bad. The boys wanted me to stop. I just wanted to be in a pop punk pizza party band, but it's fine. Whatever. <laughs> It was worth it. Um, yeah, so we're looking at management uh, in the long term. We're trying to wait. I guess once stuff starts opening up again, we'll start hassling them all again. Because, um, yeah, we're just booking our own shows is fine. It's just not, we want to play bigger, we want to play bigger shows. We want to get supports for bands, and you can't, we've, 
if you hit up a real like a a band even slightly bigger than us they start referring you off to their management to book shows because they've got all their schedules done or they know what's best for whatever bands they're not just going to play some random show down the pub on the weekend kind of thing which is good and we we like to think of it like that too because we we learned with our previous band we may have oversaturated ourselves and you just you just have diminishing returns as fun as performing is you definitely have diminishing um attendance and limited value to be gained from just playing the pub to the same people on the weekend because I guess that's different if you already have recorded music. So that was kind of a big step for us was now we have songs out there. Hopefully now that people can hear them, they'll be like, oh, this band is not some random thing that we don't know. So yeah, that would be ideal for us. We really want to get on either management or some sort of label because I guess these days a label is less about publishing music. It's more about general publicizing of your your band and putting you on tours with other bands and collaborating that way mm. at least that's how i'm perceiving it yeah i mean i honestly have very little well i mean you know relatively very little um idea of what they do but i yeah i i often consider whether i would i mean obviously nobody's knocking on my door yeah <laughs> But um, but I, I often want. Why not, Nelson? Why not? Your shit's fresh. Uh, there's not a lot of shit yet, <laughs> but it's happening. It's happening. Isn't that? Isn't that just? Isn't that just the trouble? You just got to have stuff for them to notice. Yeah. You know. Got to have, stuff. and it's. I mean, speaking for myself, it's it's coming. The stuff's coming, but mm-hmm. the, it's so hard to make, as as you know. Uh, what was I saying? Um, yeah, I often wonder, like whether. Just how necessary is a record label, even a, even a small indie one, and how I really I really don't know what kind of criteria I would set them for them to meet if if I was getting offers, um, and to, and what criteria mm. I would set myself to start um, taking offers, I guess. Um, mm. Yeah, I'm certainly not in a position now where I want to like if if a record label contacted me now i would think well that's they're obviously not legit because i don't have any music out like why why, why mm. that to me? Um, i mean that's kind of the thing right so we all grow up with like the pr company whatever they were what was it called i can't remember but the a and r company or something the one that emails every freaking band in adelaide and is like here do a thing we love your stuff and it's like what stuff you haven't seen or heard anything so i guess whatever sounds pretty dodgy and then they're all like actually it costs you four or five thousand dollars and i'm like well i don't know this isn't i think it's definitely you want to be approaching what you want you don't want someone to just like turn up at your door and be like i conveniently have this thing that suits you perfectly i'm like i don't know that you do so that's why we like we scouted out the pr company to be pr companies that manage bands of the genre and quality that we liked and then they directed us to michael and michael was like sweet that's what i'm doing with other bands and i think when we're looking at management it's really it's about the resources that they give to you so i we couldn't have done what we have done up to this point without michael because he just he just has resources and contacts and just knows people so he could get our stuff up on triple j unearthed faster than we could have because they do their whole vetting process but he's got direct contacts with people who work there so he can talk to them and be like hey this is a real thing, not some garbage that you just need to like tick the box on or whatever. And then same deal with like contacting publications. I'm sh- I'm sure some of that is just him doing the legwork, but it's not legwork that we were prepared or knew exactly how to go about. So he is doing it and he's he knows how to contact the radio stations and how to contact all the all the publications, all the he's about all these places. And like so some of the people who've written articles about us are publications that I'd never even heard of, but they clearly have an audience and I've gone there and I've checked out articles now that I know that they are there and it's good stuff. It's like, it's a great way to find new bangers, but we just wouldn't have had any of that without him. And that's kind of the same deal that we would want from management is that we don't, that it feels like there's kind of this level of legitness that you kind of need to reach where that 
otherwise if you're just some dude from the band contacting another band they're like i don't do this you got to talk to my manager book it in blah 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 you've got to go kind of already have reached a level of seriousness because i i mean i guess it's kind of the same like how like i don't know if you it's kind of a tangent but i don't know if you watched the fire documentary about that crazy music festival no it's on my list I'm a, uh, yeah definitely watch it it's watch hilarious it. um but if that was kind of a, a thing that i hadn't thought about they were talking about how bands are booking festivals and they bands of a certain caliber would expect a certain level of backline and a certain level of light production to be available and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And so if that stuff isn't provided and discussed and agreed upon and all of that stuff, then they won't play the show because they won't be able to put on the performance that they, they have to, they have a certain level they've already achieved and they need to put that out every time because it, you just can't, you can't just play a shit show. Like it'll just, it's just a disaster, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that's kind of how like once you need to take yourself seriously and book shows with bands who are also taking it seriously so that everyone has a good time and everyone at the venue is doing it serious, doing a real, doing the real job, doing the real work. I don't know. Yeah. I think my thing with, with management and record labels as an example, um, yeah, as I say, I, I don't have anything to market as yet. But as I'm kind of thinking about mm -hmm. releasing music in the in the near future, um, at what point? So, like, say if I was a big shot, like a you know a household name, for example, not that that's the goal or something that I will necessarily be. Um, but sure. Um, say if I were like when in my career when I am not that, when does a manager swap from being? Um, really pushing me to, towards people and saying, you need to hear this guy. Um, and then you know, like kind of really pushing me to people. And then when do they swap to leave him alone? Kind of like stop, um, stop giving me offers that aren't good kind of thing. Um, and mm. how capable am I of doing that myself? Like with the whole network thing, like can, can I build a network myself? Is that worth doing? Is that, I don't know. There's a lot I mean, of you certainly could. You certainly could. I feel like, and I feel, I'm sure a lot of people do, do all of this themselves in some way, shape or form, because I guess they put out enough music and build enough of a repertoire and professional image for themselves um, that then if they contact a radio station directly as that artist or a, a booking agent or whatever, then they'll be taken seriously um and maybe we yeah i just there's a lot of groundwork and slogging it out that we didn't want to do to like to get to that kind of stage and we've got like it's our first release and we want the first release to go as well as possible the first time because it cost us so much money to begin with so if we'd put out a bunch of demos like and built up a good like local audience, which we have like done a bit of that, but like if we put out a bunch of demos, a bunch of years, like just relentless putting it out, that would be one thing to have built an audience that way. But I don't know, it's just, you could do it all yourself, but you need people to take you seriously. And I feel like that for us, it's definitely helped to have a PR guy. And I don't know if there would be a position where they would discreetly switch, I mean, not, I say discreetly, I don't mean like secretively, I mean like specifically um, switch between um, pushing you and rejecting offers. Because I think, I think that probably happens almost immediately because we've just, we receive offers now that we have a track out there and we're like, mm, I don't know. And we flick it to our PR guy and he's like, oh, I don't know if you want to do that or not. It's kind of a bit of an open discussion yeah. of like, what we may or may not want to do. And the band are all pretty much on the same page of like, we know that we want to play legit shows. And to an extent, you can kind of tell what kind of stuff you're getting, whether it's the real deal or not, um, based on how established these artists or other artists already are. It feels like a bit of a weird chicken and the egg kind of situation I'm talking about here, but 
Um, yeah. It's an interesting mm. point, and I think especially because I know so little about it. And you know, I don't think anybody, even the people that are doing it and that are in it, <laughs> yeah, I don't think they know either. I, I don't think they do either. I don't know. They, I think you've really got to, yeah, that's kind of, that's an interesting like point and question, isn't it? Cause I, I, that's why we've taken so seriously presenting a professional image because I don't think, I think I'd kind of romanticized it a bit. I thought at some point we'll hit a big and then we'll be a real band, but I just feel like you already have to pretend that you are a real band and present that to everyone for them to take you seriously. And whether or not I feel like I'm still just some idiot tracking things and jumping around on stage like a fool, like maybe other people don't, maybe that's exactly what everyone else in all these other bands who are hitting it big feel like too. I don't know. Maybe they're just still doing a thing, but, um, and we just, I don't know. Yeah. It's like about, it's about where you draw the line. Cause like all of us are, are working our own jobs and trying to make our shit work. And there's only so much of that we can do without driving ourselves insane. So we've just chosen for self-preservation reasons to compartmentalize and um, delegate jobs to other parties. And so like this kind of brings me back. So like the PR guy, we have a relationship with him, but we're, we're paying him for a certain amount of time a set amount of money to work through a dedicated project with us. So once we have finished promoting the EP um, that we're releasing in June, then there'll be some promo after that to, to work on some new shows. And then if we want to work with him again on releases, then it'll be another discrete set of songs and discrete like promotion time that we would work with him with and it would be like money at a time and i think that would be kind of the same deal with management you would be paying them um i don't know, I don't know how it would be with management because that's kind of you kind of need that for a longer ongoing relationship to continue shows coming in it's a bit trickier i'm not sure what do you think yeah <laughs> I think it's become very clear that I don't know, <laughs> but is your, is your PR guy on a, on a, on a timeline? So like he's, he's with you for this release and then the relationship ends. Yeah. And, right. Okay. Mm. Yeah. I'm not, I mean, having not ended yet, I'm not really sure what that's going to look like yep. as we part ways, but it's like we've paid him a deposit. So like half of, half of the money for the work that he's he's going to do and we'll pay him some more at the end um or maybe we've got paid he might be all paid up now i can't remember but um yeah it's yeah it's set for the release so it was like he gave us a, a timeline of what we were going to do and all the key dates and the key dates include not only like release of first single release of second single it's like like five weeks before like promotion of image talking about it then like another image a week before and blah 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 and then like what do we do with the first single do we say here's a single some more music that comes soon and then for the second single we and this has all kind of been live updating because of the whole corona re situation we've had to adjust our plans a little bit which was frustrating and we've had to adjust a whole bunch of stuff because we were slated to do an actual music video with lots of people and we can't do that. So yeah. we have uploaded a lyric video instead. Um, and I mean, like same deal. We, we do a lyric video. It comes in a day later than we wanted it to. So we were going to release it all on the same day, but then we'll just promote it a week later. It's not the end of the world, but so he's got dates in his plan that are like, so when you release the second single, you'll release that with an image to promote the actual EP itself. So the, an honest mistake is the name of the single. It's also the name of the EP. 
when we release that, we'll be like, hey, also we're doing a an EP to support this whole thing and you can get that at this date. Um, whereas the first single was just like a single saying there'll be more music soon kind of thing. Mm. So yeah, it was like his, and he kind of offers these in specific deals. So we, we talked about like maybe just doing a single deal with him and that would be a certain amount of money just for one song and a bunch of promo about that. Um, but then we decided to go with one that was like a single, another single, and then an EP promoting all of that over a six month period rather than like a three month period around just one song. Um, yeah. I guess it's only half both those times. Um, does that kind of answer your request? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm learning a lot. <laughs> Um, let me just. So it. are we, Nelson? Yeah. So are we. It's how yeah. do how do you be a real artist, Nelson? How do you be the real deal? I have no idea. I wish I could tell you. Um, yep. Learn every day. Yeah. Yep. It's, Learn every day. <clears throat> it's so hard not to get all this mixed up with the with the craft and with the with the songwriting and with the performing. Like it. Yeah, I'm I'm really looking at ways to to kind of batch together different periods of time for me, which I think has been useful so far. Um, so, for example, I'm putting together um, a week where I'm just doing interviews um, for the podcast, for example, mm -hmm. and and then editing and stuff. And then another week, I'm just writing songs, and it's especially helpful. Um, very privileged position obviously um to be able to not be getting by on the skin of my teeth during this coronavirus time um because mm -hmm. of the german government being so excellent um but mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'm, I'm not working um at the moment but i'm still able to live um at comfortably and use this time to work on your project exactly yeah um yeah so i i'm what I'm looking at at the moment is, is batching. Yeah. So I'm songwriting for this time and, and I don't have to kind of change gears into interviewing mode or into editing mode or um, music business mode. Mm. So like for that period of time, I'm just doing this and it's working so far. Like I, I've, I've kind of mentioned this on previous episodes and it's not about me, it's about you, uh, but <laughs> just briefly, I guess. Um, yeah, it's it's been about six years since I've I've written a song for me, and um, it's has just been such a powerful thing for me to actually batch my time and to to think no for three hours I'm going to sit and write a song even if it's very hard then that's what I'm that's what I'm doing so mm -hmm. yeah and and it's 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 self perpetuating the the inspiration is very self perpetuating mm. so yeah that's what I'm trying out that's good um yeah. I mean, to a, a less strict extent, we kind of have, as a band, we've batched our time a little bit to work on stuff. So like when we were doing the recording and editing, we took less, we booked less shows and used the, like the times to go into the studio and edit and use the weekends for that kind of purpose. Whereas otherwise it's very easy to book a show and then you have to do a bunch of rehearsals to make sure you're all ready and tight for the show. And that takes up time. And then, so it was good to like, to have it all done. So now that we can rehearse for gigs and like, cause yeah, when we rehearse, we like to always rehearse with a purpose with like a goal in mind. So we would rehearse with either, and sometimes we would stop halfway through and change to some other direction, some other purpose, but like it would be, we're rehearsing for this gig. So this is the set list that we need to have nailed for that rehearsal. And then we might have a different set list lined up for a future show. So maybe later on when we get closer to that, we'll switch over to that. Or we'd go in and be like, we have new songs. So we'd like to dedicate today to working on the new song and jamming out new ideas and tightening up all that new stuff. Mm. So yeah, it's a bit less strict, but again, we would like, to, we like to have set kind of, no, just to know what we're working on it at any one time, we don't just kind of turn up to rehearsal and be like, Hey, what are we kind of doing here? And then play a couple of songs and then just nothing happens, you know? So I think we're, it's all kind of just normal now and it's instinctive. So we're pretty, we're fairly organized when we turn up to rehearsal. We just, we get straight into the, the set for the next show. And then 
after that we like might if we've got time we jam the new song and that kind of that's kind of how it works yeah when you're about to walk out the door to a rehearsal or even to a gig or mm-hmm. a session what does the one hour of time before walking out the door look like for you uh it looks completely uneventful or it's it's literally the hour that I wake up and fill myself full of coffee and maybe have a shower. And then I'm already 20 minutes late to rehearsal because I'm garbage at time management. So it looks much like me trying to get anywhere else on time, to be perfectly honest, just except I fill my car full of musical gear before I leave. So. <laughs> Um, what what time of the day or night are you most productive? Be that in your in your day job or in um, uh, in in music. Definitely the evenings, mm-hmm. um, which it doesn't really help um, my work life very much. But that's when I, because I'm just I'm the worst I'm the worst procrastinator of all time. I don't know it's it's slowly killing me. I need to deal with it in some way, shape or form. It hurts my soul. Um, but yeah, it's, I am most productive at the time latest in the day when I feel that I've put it off so long that I can no longer put it off anymore. And I hurt myself into doing it. And then, so that's like productive time is like 10 to one in the morning, like 10 PM to one okay. is kind of like when stuff actually happens. Mm. Um, Sometimes I'm disciplined enough to get up and do some shit. Not very often though. Yeah. <laughs> That's my story. Um, so when you're in that productive zone, like the, the mm-hmm. blue, if you like, um, mm-hmm. is that structured or is it kind of just a mess of like, get this done kind of thing? Um, it's, I guess it's pretty unstructured. It's just, yeah, I, my mind wanders between tasks often. So I very easily distracted by other tasks that I may or may not need to do. Um, that's why I like to work with people because they keep me on task. We're kind of like, we're doing this now and then we do the thing and we're all talking about it or working on it at the same time. Um, which is a bit unfair on my band that they need to wear my trash habits, but God bless them. They do a great job. Um, but yeah, it would, I would go into a session like where I've actually got a thing usually with only one goal at a time set out to accomplish. So if I was going into a thing where I'm like today, I need to edit some guitars. I would just load up the session and, procrastinate until I sat there and edited guitars for two or three hours. That's kind of how that would go down, but I wouldn't, unless I had another band member with me to work on stuff, we might do like, we've got to respond to these emails and we'll go through and do a little bit of that and send out some business stuff. And then we've got to like sign up for our account with our distribution service or whatever. We do a couple of tasks, but yeah, if it's just me, I'll just like do one task at a time and, in one session kind of deal. Yeah. Okay. Um, when was, when was the last time you felt stuck and not sure where to go existentially personally? Mm, very recently. Um, a couple of weeks after the Roni hit us hard. Um, I don't know. I'm sure everyone's felt the same kind of existential dread or whatever, but there was kind of a bit of a low point for myself personally, where I guess the week after we canceled our single launch show, Mm. uh, got pretty real then because we had some meetings with the band and I disagreed with them at that time. I'm pretty glad we've gone ahead with it all now because life goes on and you need to do, you need to just keep living. You can't just put everything off forever. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I want, basically I wanted to 
postpone the release of all of our material until we could support the release with the shows that we had booked. Yeah. Um, because for me, the end game was like, I don't love recording or editing or any of that. I love the product at the end, but the whole process in the middle is tedious and time consuming and I have no, dif- no discipline for it. Whereas when I show up for a show, I am rehearsed and we play and it's fun and I get that huge endorphin release immediately. Um, it's good. It has deadlines. It's got everything I need. It's got, it's got deadlines. It's got people. It's got alcohol. It's got it all. Um, so when we canceled all the shows, that was kind of like, I had a couple low weeks of like, the band decided to go ahead with the, the release. And I was like, well, I don't get to actually do the cathartic release part where I perform yeah. and we have all the positive response, which is great, but we only get the one opportunity to have everyone see it for the first time and have it be relevant. So I guess we'll see how it goes moving into the future to see if people still remember or care in some months time when we do book and promote shows. But that was kind of my, my low point of dread of will we ever get to tour the world? I don't know. Has Corona ruined everything forever? But I don't know. So, yep, that was my depressing time. <laughs> A few weeks ago, all the shows were, co- were cancelled and I don't know when we'll get to play shows again and nobody does and we still don't know and I was I was kind of feeling like my whole life goal of play shows to the world was threatened and uncertain and that threw me pretty seriously when when you do have disagreements um in the band Mm -hmm. is there a way or is there a is there a leader in, in the situation who will kind of not necessarily um, dictate the outcome, but uh, facilitate the conversation, I guess? Um, not strictly, but I suppose we kind of lean on Jack as the creative driving force. Mm-hmm. So it's not that he has final say in it in any way, shape or form, but um, we like to look for him to him for a bit of direction. Um, it's it's a pretty fair thing. We I mean honestly we kind of just vote on it and like they will, everyone weighs in and we all talk about it pretty openly. Mm. Um, and I say my piece and then I have a little cry and then we do whatever we decided as a group. So yeah, for sure. It must I've, be- maybe I'm sounding a little bit a little bit too bitter about the whole thing because like releasing the music has been amazing. It's been a huge boon. Um, it's been a great time. Um, I would have liked to be able to support it with the shows, but we obviously will support them with the shows at some point in the future. Mm. It's just not the way I had envisioned it. And it's all bloody fine, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah <definitely. laughs> what the hell is going on? It's a, it's a weird time. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'd just like to clarify that I, I'm not, I'm not mad at the, the guys for making the calls that they did because we've all invested heaps of money and time and they they want to make sure that they get the best value for, and for the money that we've all put in. So I totally get it. It's just, um, it's not what I wanted and I'm grumpy that we didn't get what we wanted. And it's not what we all wanted. You know, we all wanted to do the, the thing as we planned, but we can't. And so we're making compromises and figuring it out as we go. So. Yeah, yeah no, no, civil, civil disagreements are like totally, totally natural and, and like worth destigmatizing, of course. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, not not absolutely not to suggest that there's any um, any tension there. Mm-hmm. Um, can you remember the last music, the, the last piece of music, whether it was live or um, recorded, that left you speechless, kind of just in awe of either wanting to be that or wanting to feel that again? Mm. Oh, tough, tough choice. There's two that come to mind. I think um, when 
last year, 2019, pup. I'm pretty sure it was last year. I hope so. All my life has slipped away. Um, band from Canada called Pup put out an album um, called Morbid Stuff. And it's amazing. And it speaks to me on every level. And it's just, it's tight as hell, but it's nasty and punky. And that that just really inspired me. And that makes me want to play and think outside the box and do different stuff. And then on a similar level, less, less um, inspirational, I guess, but I heard a band very recently called Otterbocker Bieber, which I only heard about in after the Corona hit, but I was, I recently signed up for Spotify uh, for the first time. So checking that out, I let it auto play some playlists of what I might like. And I found this band from Japan. They're a four piece um, punk girl band and goddamn their album slaps so hard. It is relentless. It's just like, they're a force to be reckoned with so much, so many vocals. The gang vocals are crazy. Sometimes they're singing harmonies at you, all four of the band members. Sometimes they're all screaming at you all at the same time. And it's just, but there's so much energy and like levity to it because it's, it's just so passionate and enjoyable. I can just feel the energy from it. So that like made me feel something again. That was really good. That was a good stuff. But then, I guess I've, I've already gone too far, but every single time I put on um, a Dream on Dreamer record, they're like a metalcore band kind of vibe. Um, shameful, I haven't listened to the new album that they put out like a week ago or a month ago. Whoops, I need to. But every time I listen to them, they just reignite my passion for music. Their, their production, I don't know. It just makes me want to be in a metal band, play huge shows. They just sing such catchy choruses. It's just so good. Mm. What about you? What was the last one for you? I know this is an interview about me, but <laughs> tell me. The last time. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's people and artists and bands through the ages, I guess. But the last time, I don't know. It's 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 different because like sometimes the the craft of of a song and a performance is inspiring mm -hmm. and sometimes the relatability of the content is inspiring mm, agreed uh, yeah uh you know actually like kind of really simple answer but like the beatles were the last sometimes i go through slumps of like music isn't really that interesting to me for now um and then mm -hmm. always i think we all do that yeah and there's always something that like just slaps me in the face and pulls me right out of that and and it can be mm. people that i've already heard of course and familiar with their work mm. but i kind of just revisit them out of for, uh, whatever impulse um uh -huh. and yeah like the the, the beatles uh the the white album i think just before i can't remember what album it was actually um but yeah i think just after i moved to berlin um, I, I kind of put that on and I was like, ah, ha, ha, ha. let's, let's do this again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Jeff Buckley is always someone that I revisit, mm. um, his, his, uh, his, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's attention to detail or just the, the connection with his instrument being the voice or guitar. Yeah. I, yeah. Honestly, he's just an exceptional player and singer. Mm. That that one came up for me very recently too. I don't know what I, what I was doing, but I was like, try this. It had been a while since I practiced with some purpose with my guitar. So I thought what I might do is pull up some songs that I had never learned. And I pulled up, um, I can't remember which, which song it is. Jeff Buckley, fuck. It's got that augmented chord in it though. Is so tasty. I love it. Oh, I love you. What song is that? Yeah, that's Love You Should Have Come Over. 
Yeah, that banger. Yeah, mm. that is. He uh, just got he just got good chords, you know. He just knows what he's doing. Yeah, that song. Like, um, emotion emotionality aside, mm. uh, that song is just so well crafted. It. I can actually remember the first time I listened to Jeff Buckley. I don't know. Uh, as as like context, I grew up in, like as you know, and probably people tuning in also know. Um, I grew up mm-hmm. kind of not really exposed to that kind of alternative ish music. Um, mm-hmm. And the first time I listened to Jeff Buckley, it didn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, and mm. then as I kind of, I feel the same. What I, like I knew that he had a reputation for being exceptional, but I kind of listened to it and. I don't know. It didn't, didn't, didn't really make a whole lot of sense. So I thought, well, so many people rave about him. So I'm just going to put him aside, learn more about music and, you know, being at uni and surrounded by so many creative people was certainly a contributing factor to that. And then I revisited him and then, I, and then my mind was blown. Um, and it wasn't that kind I of similar experience more, happened to understood me. more about the, the craft of music. It was more just so I had, I had the, the context to be able to, appreciate appreciate it that yeah. style i guess um mm. yeah and i can remember specifically that song even after i really revisited it it took me a few listens to actually understand just how brilliantly arranged written performed mm. like it's oh yeah oh yeah sublime jeff buckley um same deal i also i heard um hallelujah and what his version of that from that album and i for some reason at the time just kind of hated that song uh, i've gotten over that period now that song is amazing it's a great song i don't know why what the hell's wrong with me but um i kind of like heard that song and was like i don't know this like wishy-washy soft alt rock thing isn't really for me i was young and foolish um, and then somebody mentioned that, like, how good the drum sound is on that album in particular. And then I put the album on again and I was like, God damn, the production on this whole album is ex- immaculate. Oh, yeah. And unbelievable. Like, oh, and then even and then you just like start thinking about it. And I'm like, man, he just, he's doing all these riffs that are actually like, try to learn a couple of them on guitar. And I'm like, he's doing stuff that's hard and interesting and all over the gaff. And what a singer, too. I mean, oh my God. Everything about that album is exceptional. So the yeah, the never pro- a dull moment. Production value alone, like um, I'm not a mm. or a recording engineer, so I can't um, speak to what's actually happening. But I love what I love is that you can hear the guitar strings on the on the um, on the electric. Um, mm. And I don't. Every know. string is so articulated. In yeah present you know yeah i mean i don't know how it was done but it was almost like they had you know an amp in the other room and a microphone on that and then the guitar in a separate room and then a microphone on the strings like the it's it's almost like kind of mm. as a hi-hat in terms of like uh playing at that um mm. at that frequency and that kind of timing um so interesting for you just, you, yeah you just you just hear every single pick noise and that he's making and every single string that he hits, like is so individually articulated. And it's like, it's like you say, it's like they've mic'd up his hands as well as the amp. Cause the amp is like, I mean, maybe, I mean, I'm sure they probably didn't. I don't know. He's just got amazing play. He's got, a, he's got finger skills, but um, yeah, it just, you hear every detail in his performance and it's beautiful. I don't know what they did. They got those compressors dialed the fuck in. Um, and I think on, uh, you were just saying about Hallelujah, like it's mm-hmm. such an overplayed song. Uh, like like a lot of really good songs, they're really overplayed and, and it's a shame that mm-hmm. they lose their magic to, to some people. But yeah, like that song can still like silence me or a crowd and like, yeah, mm-hmm. very immersive. Um, what's, the, what's the common thread between artists that you really enjoy? Because you listen quite broadly, mm. genre-wise. I kind of like. Mm, I kind of like everything up to eleven. I like the extremes. I like it all to be happening all at once. 
Right. Um, like I wouldn't, if I'm going to like chill out and listen to music, then I'll just slap on the old lo-fi hip hop beats and mm -hmm. relax. But like when I'm listening to music ordinarily, I like it to be pretty engrossing. So I think the commonality is like an intensity, um, hear the passion in it all. And yeah, cause I'm thinking like the crossover between like all the, all the crazy thick wall of sound punk music kind of stuff that I'm listening to. And then some of the like electronica that I would listen to is also pretty, pretty dense, very, mm, very in your face. And even like stuff like Billie Eilish's new album, uh, I mean, it's not that new and now, but whatever. Um, like whilst that is much more sparse, every sound is very, very present, very in your face. And it's like, it's all about that intensity. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like intensity doesn't necessarily have to mean, um, uh, like a violent kind of, mm. it can, it can be a soft. Intensity. So like, yeah, like even like that song when the, when the party's over or whatever it is, is like a very chilled back kind of, but it's just, it's so in your face with its detail and everything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if we're just, yeah, if we're just talking recording music and then the same deal goes for kind of for live. I just want it. I want to be, I want them to be going hard on stage. I want to watch them go nuts. I love that shit. Mm -hmm. Biggest influence of a band on me ever probably is the, the, the Dillinger escape plan. I talk about it all the time because they're just, they're just insane. I just love watching them destroy their bodies for my enjoyment. It's so entertaining. You have a, um, a, a, a process or a practice that gets you in the, in the state to be able to perform live at that emotional level. Mm, not hugely. Um, I will say that for the Wolf and Chain Band in particular, when we when we started dressing up and putting on makeup and shit, that we did that to kind of initially to put out a persona, a consistent persona every time and kind of help pull the audience into a vibe without even hearing us so they can see what we're putting out it's just good to like be visually identifiable as well as sonically, mm. I feel. Um, but that had the added benefit of put on all the makeup it helps me to like remove my regular persona and be in my band live persona a bit. Yeah. But having said that, it always, almost always, with the exception of a couple of shows, it takes me like the first song to like warm into it a little bit. Yeah. Um, I need, I need to figure out, you're right. I need to figure out a way to like switch quicker into that persona. Cause you really don't have any time. The bent, like people need, you need to be putting out that intensity almost immediately. And that's why I love bands like that. Cause they were like, they just capture you from the very first moment with their lights and their sound and all of their movements. So you don't have, you don't have, half the first song to figure that out you need to be doing it straight away so that's something i need to work on but yeah um let's um let's finish up with with this question um mm. is there something you've changed your mind about in the last two years and how did you come to that conclusion <laughs> It's a tough question, Nelson. Damn. What have I changed my mind about? Mm. Mm. I don't know, man. That's. Uh, I can't think of anything on top of my head for that one. Shit. 
is there a belief that you hold extremely strongly like not necessarily about the world even about yourself perhaps that you're holding strongly for no particular reason that you've kind of noticed and think oh yeah i think that i don't really know why oh, i guess kind of related to that maybe i think some of this experience as a an up-and-coming band has kind of had me question how I put successful artists up on a pedestal as if they're somehow superior to me in some way, shape or form, like they're doing something that I couldn't or am not. Um, so that's been kind of confronting to me personally to feel a bit like, yeah, it kind of ties into that, like that kind of, when will we be a real band? When will I get to do the real band thing? But I kind of already just have to do it and it's scary and I don't want to do it because it's work. Um, and the only difference really between, I mean, I, I might be wrong, but like the only difference that I really see between myself and an artist who's out there touring the world is like, like actively doing it and putting in all the work and that's just like oh, i just i just want it to happen i don't want to do all this work nelson i'm so sleepy <laughs> yeah um, yeah so that's kind of been confronting to like have the artist pull down like feel yeah like I've, it's, uh, it's just a confronting concept to realize that they're also real normal people doing trying to struggle through the existence like everybody else does yeah um Mm. so yeah um where can people find you as an individual online and also your band and and, and anything you want to kind of plug that's coming out um i don't really have much on my individual side you can hear a couple of silly tracks on my soundcloud if you search my name um and I have a website with some links to some stuff, which I'll send you. Um, it's horrifically out of date. Maybe I'll update it before I send it all your way. Um, and then you can find my band at Wolf and Chain Band on Facebook and on Twitter, same handle, and Instagram. Pretty sure it's all the same. Where we're posting all our stuff. You can also find me at Alexander Black Music. I play guitar for his band once we're all gigging again. And then uh, Rosa Band on Facebook and Instagram as well. Instagram? Yes. Thank you so much for making the time today and suffering with me Thank through you. the technical glitches and uh, my general awkwardness. Um, really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to my meaningless rambling god bless you i had a great time uh my band's ep comes out on june 5th check it out <laughs>